Coming up on episode 16 of the R Podcast, we continue our series about Shiny, with this time interviewing Dean Atelli. We touch on his motivations for creating Shiny JS as well as how he got started with using R. It's a fascinating conversation and I learned a lot just by talking with him in a short time. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I just have one question for you. Are you ready? Hi everyone, this is episode 16 of the R Podcast. I am your host, Eric Nance, and we are continuing our series about using Shiny and other related packages for web application development with R. And this is a particularly exciting time in terms of those uh, concepts because as I record this, we are about to kick off the uh, Shiny Developer Conference, the first ever Shiny Developer Conference in Palo Alto, California. Um, this is my first time back in California in quite a few years. I had, I knew the traffic was bad, but it was pretty bad. <laughs> I'll just say that. Um, but through some good luck, I got here in one piece. And what I'm hoping for as I'm here for this conference is not only to expand my skills as a shiny application developer, but this is frankly the first time I've been in any R specific conference frankly ever I've been using R for quite a few years and the fact that this is my first one I'm taking advantage and soaking in all all the resources in and one thing I am trying to do this this uh, short couple days is to talk with various members of the community and hopefully with our the R studio team themselves but for the first um, shot at this, I had the pleasure of sitting down with Dean Atelli. And you'll, I think you'll really enjoy this interview coming up. We touched on a lot of it, um, interesting topics, such as his motivation for Shiny JS, and also how he got started with using R. And in particular, he has some really um, cool things to say about the uh, statistics course that he's been a teaching assistant for at the University of British Columbia. So enough with me uh, babbling on here. I think let's get to the good stuff, as they say. So here we are with our main topic for today, our interview with Dean Atelli. All right, everyone. It is the eve of the first ever Shiny Developer Conference. And I have the privilege of actually conducting my first interview of the weekend. And we have shot for the stars, so to speak. I am here sitting with Dean Atelli, who is famous for actually quite a few R packages now. But I first heard of his work with Shiny.js, so I'm going to be asking him about that. But without further ado, Dean, uh, welcome to the R podcast, and thanks for joining me. Yeah, no, thank you. This is great to be here. And good job saying Shiny.js. That's the way you're supposed to say it. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. You can say it in many other ways. Whatever ways have they said it? <laughs> um, shiny Juice this is a very common one. I don't know why. <laughs> I, I, mean, I admit that never came to my mind, yeah. but... Maybe because I've always been interested in the web technologies, JS, JavaScript, all that stuff. Exactly. Kind of natural to me. So, mm -hmm. um, so Dean, uh, for our listeners, maybe you could tell us a bit about your background and how you got started using R. Sure. So my background is actually in uh, computer science. So I have a bachelor's of computer science. And um, I've worked for a few years as a software developer and as, um, as a web developer in San Francisco mm -hmm. in the Bay Area. And after doing, uh, after working for a few years, I went to grad school at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. 
And over there, my first course, my first ever course was with um, Jennifer Bryan, oh, who yes. some of you may know, and she's also here at the conference too. That's cool. And she taught a uh, course Stat 540, which is which was my introduction to R, and ever yeah. since then I've been hooked. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, that course, I mean, I've, I've seen the material she puts out there, and uh, you've also helped with the course. We might get to that later, but I think that's setting a trail for anybody that's going to be teaching an introduction to R. I think that's a blueprint for how to do it. I mean, first of all, it hooked you, obviously, but I mean, yeah. I'm sure it's hooking a lot of other students at the university too. So that's- Yeah, it's amazing. Every, everybody who takes it loves it. Yeah, I wish we had had that when I was in school. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so as you, as you mentioned, you kind of have an interesting background that was outside of R in the beginning. Um, in terms of the skills you developed in those in that line of work, do you think that helped you learn R any better than maybe if you hadn't had those experiences or did it actually make things harder for you? No, for sure. It definitely helped because, you okay. know, when, when we took the course at 540, half the class had programming experience beforehand and half the class didn't. So okay. obviously me, I knew what for loops are, what if statements are, I knew how variables work. Yeah. So it was a lot easier to pick that stuff up. R was a little bit different from what I'm used to. <laughs> and I think a lot of people know that, you know, the fact that it's right. one based indexing and not zero based indexing like a lot of other languages. Which is. So some things were weird. Yeah, yeah. but in general, it definitely helped. Yeah, I, some people think it's really weird. I mean, I I feel like some people that come from Python and they get to R, they're they're totally flabbergasted by some of the concepts behind it. But you, people have to remember that R was not written by programmers. It was written by statisticians. That's right. And the way statisticians think may be just a bit different than the way uh, typical computer programmers think. You know, so. But anyway, I. It does have its quirks. Yeah, but. and it works perfectly for, for the tasks it, it, it needs to work for. It works perfectly for statisticians and for data analysis. Exactly. Job. Exactly. And and speaking of, you know, doing things for statisticians, I mean, w what we're here for this week, and obviously is the newer developments of Shiny, and with Shiny being, of course, the frankly, one of the biggest revolutions I've seen in the R computing space in, in years, probably next to R Markdown, <laughs> frankly. Um, but getting to the Shiny ecosystem in general, obviously, as I mentioned, you're the author of Shiny JS. Um, maybe you could tell our listeners some of the motivation for creating Shiny JS um, from the start. Sure. So when I first learned about Shiny about a year and a half ago, um, I noticed that I wanted to do a few things that were not available in Shiny. So a lot of times I wanted to be able to disable an input button or to hide some UI elements. Mm -hmm. And these things were just not available, so you had to use JavaScript to do that. And so I noticed that there was just code that I was always copying into all of my different Shiny apps. And it was not, you know, it was, it was quite a bit of code and it was quite verbose. So I figured maybe I should just make a package out of it so I could just do it in every app I have. Yeah, right. And then I looked and I also saw that on Stack Overflow, a lot of people asked questions about how to do these exact things that I was doing. Mm -hmm. So I figured it could help a lot of people. So. It was actually about exactly a year ago. I was flying back from a shiny conference. I was on the plane to Vancouver. Oh, really? And I sat down and okay. decided I'll just do the package right now because I have nothing else to do. No internet, no distractions. <laughs> I'll be productive, make a package. You know, that's funny. And sometimes when we take away the things we depend on for a lot of our other work, it helps you focus like that. Yeah. Like, I have a funny story. When I was on the way here on my flights, of course, I'm not going to pay for Wi Fi in an airport, okay. right? So what did I do? I put a lot of the shiny kind of articles from the R Studio site in my pocket, like references, so I could read on my cell phone without having the internet. But I was like, okay, I have some time to really devote to that. But nice. it's amazing just having, even though obviously it does so many great things for us, sometimes you just need to unplug a little bit just to, to focus sometimes. Yeah, but, and I was thinking ahead on your part, good job. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was kind of on the fly too. Like this morning when I was packing, I was like, oh man, I got to get those downloads because I'm not going to pay for air airplane yeah. Wi-Fi. <laughs> I'm, I'm too cheap for that. <laughs> So obviously, Shiny JS, um, y you I think have a lot of expertise in JavaScript. Obviously, um, right? yeah. You know? Well, I was a web developer for a couple yeah. of years before coming to school. So yeah. right, right. So, in your opinion, for anybody that's maybe getting interested in maybe extending Shiny or maybe some other custom things with JavaScript, um, for somebody like I would say for me personally, yeah, I did some PHP stuff in the past, but I have done absolutely nothing with JavaScript. Do you have any kind of resources you might recommend to somebody if they want to kind of get a, their their toes a little dipping into the JavaScript world, so to speak? Sure. You know? uh, well, first of all, I would say that I think in order to make your Shiny apps better, the first thing that's 
going to be the most useful for most people is actually CSS, not JavaScript. Oh, interesting. I noticed that a lot of questions that people ask a lot of times do have to do with just simple styling. So learning CSS, it's also a lot easier. Okay. So I recommend people learn, you know, the basics of CSS first. Okay. As far as JavaScript, um, I think Codecademy has a really, really good, um, you know, JavaScript tutorial course kind of thing. Okay. And I also usually like to use W3 Schools. Oh, it's a website yes. that has tutorials for a lot of different languages. It's pretty short and easy, mm -hmm. but it gets you just the basics and understand what JavaScript is, what it does. Okay, okay. So maybe you can try that. And yeah. I'm sure Google has a million other suggestions. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> More than a million. <laughs> yeah, and, and the key is filtering the, the, the noise from the actual good stuff yeah. too. But um, yeah, and maybe some I get into down the road, but I think one of the interesting things that kind of ties with JavaScript with Shiny is this whole ecosystem of HTML widgets that's been popping up. Um, yeah. I've seen some really interesting ones like with network diagrams, you know, like Viz Network or Diagrammer, things like that, where as an R user, I don't have to know JavaScript to use them. I mean, I just do like a render function or whatever, and it's it's running my app. So part of me is like, what, is it kind of dangerous not to know a little bit how it works under the hood or, or am I taking too big of a leap? But I, I like what you said, maybe CSS is, a, is an easier one to crack at first and then maybe learning that will kind of give me some more fundamental skills to learn JavaScript. Yeah, and, and also a lot of these HTML widgets you're mentioning, um, a lot of them are actually very simple and just include a few lines of code. So we could just go to the GitHub page, look at the source. Yeah. And you learned a bit of JavaScript. That, that's right. <laughs> the best way to learn and see how people much smarter than me have done it. So yeah, <laughs> it's all open source. So it's all yeah. open source, right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously, as you've been using Shiny for, sounds like almost since the beginning, um, You've written some really good material on your blog about Shiny. Like you've done a really nice tutorial that I think anybody that's new to it should read. We'll put it in the show notes just in case people aren't familiar with it. Um, but it was also interesting to see that you did a tutorial on using external data storage with a Shiny app. And that's actually been morphed into the official Shiny documentation. Yes, yes, it which is. Which I think that... That, that's cool, man. I mean, I really like that. Maybe you could tell us a bit about what it's like to kind of work with the R Studio team on kind of sharing some of those resources and getting yeah. them out there. Yeah, no, it definitely is. It's super cool. I think so too. You know, I still think, oh, wow, I have an article on R Studio's website. You're right. It's amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, famous. so yeah, that's, that's my biggest, you know, call to fame. So um, about half a year, more than half a year ago, actually, I was talking to someone at R Studio. I think it was Tarif. And um, he was telling me how he likes some of my blog posts. So I was telling him that there's another one I want to, I really want to write soon about how to store data in Shiny mm -hmm. apps. Mm -hmm. So he was telling me that he actually thinks it's really, really useful. So why don't they host it? I, I can write it and they'll host it in our studio so it gets more publicity. And he even said they'll pay me for it. So I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah, I was going to do it anyway. So if you yeah. want to give me a bit of money for it. Wow. You know, I'm a student, so anything yeah. helps. <laughs> right. So I remember those month. days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So I, I wrote the app. Uh, sorry, I wrote the article a couple months later. And then I sent it to, to our studio. Mm -hmm. Garrett got back to me. He gave me a lot of edits. And Garrett was great because he didn't just edit it. He also, he also gave me comments about why he did the edits he did. And he kind of helped me become a better writer. And, and he taught me some stuff. So... It was really nice working with Garrett up on that. Cool. And then it was done, and they, they just published it right away. Wow, that that that's exciting. But to me, it kind of speaks to the way our studio, the our studio team, has gone about their kind of development process. Everything being open source, reaching out to the community in in key situations, and I think I'm seeing more and more of that now and, and frankly i wish other companies would follow a similar mindset but that's... yeah and no i mean I, and it was great working with like everyone in our studio they're they're an amazing team of people yeah it's I, i'm so geeked to meet them tomorrow that's gonna be it's kind of like meeting celebrities frankly but <laughs> they, they are they are for a lot of people oh all i of know us. right i mean i mean i'm people that may have listened to my earlier episodes i'm now on probably what my 11th year of using r but what wow. they have done to transform my workflow. I mentioned on earlier episodes, the whole, you know, ggplot2 being like my, my go-to visualization package. And of course the Hadley verse, as they say, of like the plier tidy R yeah. and all that. It just makes all my day-to-day -day stuff, especially when I get messy data sets so much easier. And goodness, the pipe, I mean, 
where was that all these yeah, years, it's, right? It's so useful. <laughs> I know, right? And, and it's a fundamental Linux concept, right? But all it took was, you know, somebody just somebody just had thing. to do it. Yep, and then scratching an itch, and and they did. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I, f I feel really lucky that I only started. I only got into R two and a bit years ago, which was, I think, it's a perfect time. It was just when Hadley was really picking up, making exactly. a ton of packages. Shiny just came out just before that. Exactly. It's really nice time to get into. It. And R Studio has like really picked up and accelerated its features right. in the past two years. Right, right. So lucky. <laughs> yeah, I, I still remember, I may have told this story in other episodes, when our studio first came out, like the IDE, when it was actually launched. I don't even know. When was that? How many years ago was that? It was at least three years ago or so. Oh, very recent. It, yeah, maybe three or four. Yeah, I wow. mean, it's not that long, but... It, For me, the, it's forever. Yeah, right. That's all I know. <laughs> but I remember when they you know, they did the desktop edition first, I believe, and then they did the server edition. And I was like, okay, I'm going to throw this on my Linux server at home and try it out. I mean what's a harm, right? I know how to do Linux servers. And then I was like, hey, I bet people at my workplace would like this too. So I worked in my IT group. They're like, hey, let's throw our serial server on a spare server that's just, you know, a virtual machine somewhere. And lo and behold, people started to gravitate towards it, but they made it so easy for people to get started with it. And yeah, they did. Wh whenever I see like a new R user using like the default GUI, <laughs> I feel pain for you them. You see people still doing that? <laughs> Unfortunately, I do. Yeah, especially on the Windows side. At least yeah. we have Jenny Bryan at our university and a lot of people who are knowledgeable yes. enough about it that I don't yes. really see too often. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, that, you know, like I said, I, I kind of went to that. I'm like, hey, guys, you know our studio's out there, right? But <laughs> that's another story for another yeah. day. Um, so, so getting back to Shiny for a second, obviously we have version 0.13 that's been released with a lot of mm -hmm. new features, which we're going to be hearing a lot about tomorrow and Sunday. Yeah, I'm really excited for that. Me too. And speaking of that, of the newer things that have been talked about, especially in the release notes or under the hood, what are some of the newer features you're most excited about, especially of your work going forward? Yeah, so the new version, when I first looked at the um, the release notes, it was only about a week ago, I think. Yeah, um, it wasn't too long ago. Yeah, I was very impressed. There was so much work in this new version and so many features that are super cool. Right. I think the new modules feature is going to be really useful for a lot of people. Yes. Um, yes. But the one I'm excited about, I haven't actually used it yet, but it seems really fun, um, the gadgets. Oh, so what gadgets yeah. allow you to do, if I understand it correctly because I haven't tried it yet, is you can write a Shiny app that actually returns a value to the user. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you have a data set and you want to be able to kind of look at it and pick a few points and remove those points, you could write a Shiny app that visually shows you a plot of the, of the data set and you can pick points on it and then say exit and then you're back to the R console and you have those points saved. Right, right. So it, it sounds really fun and like you can do a lot of that. A lot of stuff with it, I'm sure. Yeah, I see. I see lots of potential for it, especially just in like a pipeline of a statistical analysis to make things a little easier interactively if you especially if you're doing with a messy data set and you want to like visual look at the issues maybe do a quick filter or something where i i just could see it helping people's workflow immensely and you don't for have sure, to make yeah. a a full-blown shiny app for it it's just a, a little gadget so to speak so i mean there's I see, I see a lot of cool, cool potentials there. Um, so that's what's been released in, in this upgrade that's just happened. Do you have any ideas for features that maybe you're hoping to see down the road? Maybe things that you think Shiny's missing? Yeah, so there, there's one. I, I mean, if you look at the uh, on the GitHub page at Shiny and you go to their issues, there's quite a few issues that have <laughs> that have filed <laughs> against them. So there's a lot of things I want them to do. Right. But um, one of the big ones that I think would be cool, but I'm not sure. I don't think too many people would find it very useful. Is uh, supporting multi-page apps. So mm. what I mean by that is right now Shiny is meant to just be a single-page app. Um, but a lot of websites, the way they work is obviously, you know, you click on links and you go to different pages on the website. And that's something that you can't really do natively in Shiny right now. I've seen some people try to, you know, try to use Shiny to to fake that. Okay. But it's not very really built in into Shiny. It would be really cool if it was because I can see some uses for it. Yeah, uh, I see that too. I, in, in, in my workplace, I have some teams that are doing different kind of web applications where it's kind of like a, a big umbrella app but they have like little sub apps inside right yeah, exactly. so so yeah I, I like you said i've seen people try to mimic this in the community a bit and i think i've seen people do like a whole bunch of like render uis and with nav bar pages and trying to trick it almost exactly yeah. yeah which feels a little bit hacky but you do what you can 
right until it gets implemented if it gets implemented I'm right not sure. yeah and until it does frankly i'm probably gonna be following a similar approach to some of the stuff i'm working on because <laughs> it, it's one thing to do like a very basic plot in a data table or things like that but if you have this whole pipeline of importing data cleaning it inspecting it visualizing it do some kind of maybe machine learning algorithm or something like that on top of maybe launching it on some kind of high performance computing mm -hmm. structure there's a whole bunch of little sub apps if you will within that whole work stream that mm -hmm. you know we just got to kind of figure out what's a more logical way of maintaining exactly. that and developing it because... yeah sometimes it just makes more sense to be split up into a few different pages exactly exactly yeah. so i'll i'll definitely check out those issues uh, yeah. to see what, I what mean, the feedback I, yeah. I trust our studio like blindly so i know that whatever they work on will be <laughs> good right right useful. right right <laughs> yeah so so you mentioned you've been in, in graduate school at ubc yeah. and um i believe you're studying bioinformatics correct or? yes i'm a bioinformatics student that's cool um so I, i'm just curious um what have you been able to incorporate for as far as like r and shiny into your current studies for bioinformatics you know how has that helped you in, in that in those fields mm, so so what i'm doing actually there is um there's a new technology in, bio in biology that that currently, because it's new, um, there, there's no tools right now that are available to analyze the data coming out of it automatically. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is I'm writing um, some algorithms, some methods in R that can read that data and analyze it automatically instead of manually. So that's how I'm using R okay. in, in my work. And then I'm also using Shiny because when I first gave those R scripts that would implement all my methods, I gave them to a biology lab, they weren't able to run them because oh. they aren't familiar with R. Yes, yes, So right, that was a right. big problem. So, I, so, I, so, so actually that's why I learned Shiny because my supervisor, Jenny Bryan, told me about this th Shiny thing that exists that I could convert my R code into you know, a web app so people can just press buttons. <laughs> and, and since then, I, I looked into Shiny and I'm really glad that happened. <laughs> wow, yeah, so so it's great where people like Jenny are plugged into what the community's yeah. up to, and people like our studio or whoever else, to kind of put these seeds out there for people like you or maybe other students and be like, hey, you might want to look at this, you know, maybe it won't solve everything, but give it a shot. But and it did. <laughs> it, it solved a lot, right? So, yeah, no, I think uh, the, the whole field of bioinformatics, um, at my workplace, I have a team that is involved with a lot of uh, that kind of genetic or, or gene expression data, things like that. And when I gave like a little tutorial about Shiny, and I wasn't doing any revolution, I was just showing them what was out there, they were hooked. And now I have a team that is becoming more expert at Shiny than I am now. But it's like once you plant the seed, that people can kind of take off of it. So the key is just keeping up with everything because there's yeah. so much cool stuff exactly. happening in the community that sometimes it's, you might miss something and you're like, oh man, wish I had known that like years ago, right? So yeah. No, it's useful to just like be on Twitter and kind of see what the buzzwords that people are right, saying are so right. you know what exists, what yeah. to look at if you, if you need something. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So obviously I'm going to take a, go on a limb here but our studio itself the id is probably a big part of your toolbox for mm -hmm. our development um do you have any other tools that you augment with that in your development or is that honestly our studio is the the main one okay yep. it, it's amazing the, the stuff you do with it um i do use make files quite often oh okay uh, but even that's kind of built into our studio now so you could just make from our studio um, Git obviously is, yes. is very big. Um, yes. You know everything has to always be on Git. Every little thing, and you have to commit all the time. But yes. I'm sure most people, a lot of people who use R, uh, are under that mindset. <laughs> and you know, I write some Bash scripts sometimes if I need something, um, some little sure. things that. But but it's mainly our studio. <laughs> yeah. No. But you, you. That's my favorite tool. <laughs> yeah. No. Obviously. Yeah. I I tell people when when I'm you know my day to day at work there usually is an R Studio server window up there somewhere because I'm always doing something with it. Um, you mentioned Git though. I think, you know, I think these days the awareness is out there that if you're mm -hmm. going to be a reasonable data scientist that wants reproducibility not just for other people at, with your work but for yourself too and to have a restore point if you horribly break things or if you want to try new things. I think Git is just, I'm so glad that our studio has integrated that so easily with, with the IDE so that yeah. you can point and click little things and write the little commit message and not have to know too much about how it works. But of course, if you dive into the Git world, you learn about branching and tagging and all that good stuff. So, I mean, 
I think one challenge I've seen is that there are some statisticians I've worked with that have never, ever touched version control before. That's horrible. It, it, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so <laughs> I guess maybe since you've been using it for quite a while, it sounds like in your work, have you ever tried to teach, like, get within, like, the R development pipeline to any of your fellow students or anything like that? Yeah, I've definitely shown it to, to a lot yeah. of my to a lot of my colleagues, um, some other students in my program in it takes it's not that easy it, it takes a bit of, uh, of time to get them understanding why it's useful and how to use it sure but it's really cool you know the first time that they that they they do something and they tag you in it in a comment and you realize wow they actually know how even tagging works they're, they're literally using git now cool. oh, sorry this is github not git well i understand i understand yeah, yeah yeah there's a lot of overlap for right the stuff we do right right um, yeah and in the course we teach uh, stat 540 we also really really focus on git Mm -hmm. every, every student has to submit their homework through GitHub. So we really want to make sure that the next generation of data scientists are, have just a very good understanding of Git and version control and why it's really important. Right, right. And I think for package development, too, it's hugely yeah. important as well. Obviously, I've seen your GitHub of Shiny.js and your other packages, and you've always been on top of issues. In fact, I've I think I've nagged you about an issue either with Shiny JS or another package yeah, or one of the two, but uh, <laughs> but you're you're very upfront with it. But it, it's so easy to collaborate with people, yeah, and it's, it's it could be awesome. anybody from the other side of the world. Just just having it out there is yeah. the, the best thing. And yeah, but there is quite a steep learning curve. I mean, it's it's not fun in the first week or two, yeah. either learning it or teaching it, because people ran into so many problems with Git in the beginning. Yeah, it's it's inevitable. Yeah, that's on my. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I've. I'm working with a team on a like it's actually an interesting project where we're converting an old S sweeve like report mm -hmm. over to R markdown and I have I had access to like an internal Git repo, kind of like GitHub, but a different thing. And and I, I, I had this very detailed readme of like, hey, this is the steps you take. And, you know, they've actually been pretty good with it. But there was one time something broke and I just like, OK, just recall it. Uh, then you can't do it. anything. I can't do anything. But uh, <laughs> it, it kind of made me a little disappointed, not for them, but for me, because I feel I, I since I'm using it so much, I, it's kind of up to me to teach it the right way. So. I'm trying to get better Not with Not many but. people can claim to be experts in Git or know what to do when errors come up. Yeah, exactly. You just have to accept that. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it's just kind of going through different examples of like, here's what you might approach if things break or things like that. Mm -hmm. But but at least like with your example of Shiny JS and others, we can see how other people do their commits and their branches, strategies, and things like that to kind yeah. of emulate that with our package development or whatever analysis we're working on. Um, so as you, as you mentioned, you, you're you somewhat new to the R world, although now you're obviously- well, Two and something years now, yeah. Yeah, but um, to, to people, especially listening to this podcast and may have been interested in R and haven't really dived into it yet, do you have any kind of tips that you would share based on your experience or what you've seen in your in your um, UBC courses that could help them get quickly up to speed or things like that? So I I know this is going to sound like an ad, <laughs> but I really, really believe that Stat540, the course that, that that's how I learned R, I really think that's an amazing way to learn R. Um, and, and it's up there, it's, it's out online. And I know that a lot of people from other places, not just from Vancouver, do go to that website to learn R. Mm-hmm. Because um, we do sometimes get issues on our Git, on our GitHub page uh, from people who we don't know from other countries. Right. So it's clear that people do use it to learn, and you know that's how I learned R. I think it's amazing. But I also know about this new um, new thing, Swirl. Have you heard of that? Yes, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So, Why don't we tell our listeners about that? Yeah. Go ahead. I, I, honestly, I'm not. I don't actually know exactly what it is. So do you want to? <laughs> okay. Well, I. It sounds like it's this kind of package that almost as like an interactive R tutorial yes, where yeah. you can, you it'll, it'll walk you through different like work, you know, analysis questions or how you do something in R and it, it gives you like multiple choices, I believe. And it'll, it, I, mean, I can't remember exactly the details of it, but, but I, I agree. I think that could be an interesting way to get somebody kind of throwing them in there and letting them see for themselves how it works in an interactive fashion. So. Yes, it's right. So it, so it makes you learn R interactively and it helps you along the way. Right, But right. the Stat540 website also has amazing tutorials from beginning to end. And the, the one thing I like about it, which is maybe not what everyone's looking for, is that in our course, um, we completely let go of all the statistics. So a lot of times if you look at our tutorials, you'll see a lot of things about statistics, but right, we kind of right. ignore all that. 
and we just focus on on our stuff and programming with it right right so if that's what you want to learn then maybe give that a shot yeah absolutely well it's out on github right so i mean that's the best part is that nobody no matter whatever school people are going to it's there's no wall in front of it right yeah <laughs> yeah I, i'm just curious so was there ever any resistance to doing that kind of model from like the university are they all okay with honestly it? i don't know because i just okay. joined uh i just started being a ta last year a year ago okay so, sure sure yeah um but i i don't think so i think it's fine yeah, well, I mean, I, I just hope other universities follow suit, too, because it, you don't have to keep everything closed, especially if it helps yeah. benefit your personal curriculum as well. So, I mean, like, I mean, I, whether it's an ad or not, I, I'm going to put that in the show notes because I think it's a valuable resource for people yeah. as well. Um, so obviously, this has um, been a really fascinating um, interview to get to know your projects and what your your work has been like with R. Um, for those who want to keep up with the things you're up to, what's the best way for them to follow you know your projects or just what you're up to in general? Uh, I didn't think it was important enough to have someone follow my projects, but uh, <laughs> I think if you just you know if you're subscribed to um, to our bloggers and you just follow it from every now and then, sure. Um, you know, you should be able to see if I do anything new that's really cool, whenever cool. that happens. And we'll also put a link in the show notes to your personal blog too. Cause right, yeah. So I have my website, which yep. is where, you know, I have a lot of blog posts where I write mostly about R and Shiny. Yep. And you can you can subscribe to my blog. I don't know if anyone ever has actually clicked on the little RSS link. I mean, it's there. <laughs> I, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do. Yeah. Maybe. But yeah, I mean, our, our bloggers is a good way to keep up. Yeah, that, that's true. Everything that's that's in my daily morning reading, right? Yeah. Some people read a newspaper. I read our bloggers. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Works for me. It's a lot more fascinating sometimes. Yeah. Open Twitter, open our bloggers, open yep. sports news. <laughs> yeah. You're set. Get your coffee. You're done, right? <laughs> well, oh, Dean, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. And obviously, we're going to see each other at the conference uh, tomorrow and Sunday. But uh, thank you so much. Yeah, no, thank you, Eric. Yeah, and I'm really excited for this weekend. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, everyone. We're, we'll uh, wrap up after this. So that was our interview with Dean, and I do want to thank him for taking the time to sit down with me. Um, he also encountered some pretty bad traffic there as well, but he got there just like I did, and I think that was a really engaging conversation, and you can tell immediately how enthusiastic he is about R, and even though he hasn't been using it, um, for more than a couple of years, he has already made some huge waves in the community. And I think there's a much, even bigger things coming from him as, as the years go on. So we're, we're really lucky as a, as a community to have someone like Dean um, doing such innovative things, especially in the, the space of Shiny development. So um, this episode probably won't have quite as the same format as the previous episodes, but... Um, I do want to include at least one thing that we mentioned during the interview when it comes to how we educate others that are new to R with, you know, getting them up to speed quickly. So that actually is going to tie into our package pick. So you, you probably heard during the interview that Dean mentioned an interesting package called Swirl. Now, I have briefly explored Swirl, um, but I'll, I'll give you some background as I understand it. Um, so think of it this way. As someone is learning about R, wouldn't it be cool if while they're actually inside R or trying to use it, they're actually teaching themselves the concepts of R without actually leaving the R console. Well, that's exactly what the Swirl package is aimed to do. So it's an interactive kind of tutorial, if you will, but it's all within a single package called Swirl. And once you install the package and you start a function appropriate enough called Swirl, then you get started with basically a course. And 
there is a default course included in there but what they've done is they've enabled it and given it kind of an API if you will for others to actually um, contribute a, a course or a series of lessons so I think this is, is giving us a great foundation especially for those of us that are in the position of trying to teach R to new users or even users from a different statistical package there's one with three letters that comes to mind that I have to deal with quite a bit um, but anyway um, swirl I think could be an interesting way to make something you know interactive because I think that's the best way people learn is to actually try doing something but instead of having to jump back and forth between interfaces or between a huge slide deck and then back to the console back and forth you could actually augment this within say an RStudio instance that's specifically customized for a particular course that uses Swirl at the back end. So I'm gonna try this out a little more. I mean I, I did some brief um, explorations of this uh, about a year or so ago but I think it's probably gone a lot more advanced since the last time I looked at it. And I'll put a link for the uh, Swirl uh, documentation site in the show notes. There's already quite a bit of material about using it to learn about R or also how if you're teaching R, how you can use Swirl effectively. And, and also part I'm, more, I'm mostly interested in is how we can contribute different lessons to it. So... Um, I think I think there's a lot of potential there and anything that we can use as a community to help kind of teach R to others I definitely want to explore for myself as well as you know try like I said try to educate others for how powerful R is so swirl is our package pick um, and with that I think I'm gonna wrap up episode 16 um, there's, like I said, this is an ongoing series about Shiny, and I'm definitely hoping in the next uh, couple of days as I'm here at the Shiny Developer Conference that I can bring back a lot more content, hopefully in the form of interviews. And then once the conference concludes, I'll definitely um, get my thoughts on what I learned and where I think uh, the future direction of Shiny is going. Um, so that's going to wrap up episode 16. I definitely want to thank everyone that has uh, gotten back uh, listening to the podcast after, uh, as you know, we had a quite a long hiatus there for a while, but I am in the back in the swing of things, as they say. Um, if you want to access the previous episodes as well as keep up with um, the status of future episodes, um, you'll definitely see our post uh, cross-linked on our bloggers um, that's what as you heard in the interview that's become a big part of mine and dean's uh, morning routine <laughs> is pursuing our bloggers um, but you also are invited to check out the podcast site at www.r-podcast.org so far the new site is working pretty well for me um, the only thing that's a bit of a sore point right now is getting back to iTunes. And to make a long story short, I'm trying to write a custom plugin for my um, the, the website software I'm using because I think I'm one of the first people that have used this um, particular framework that's doing this for a podcast. So lots of learning about little bits of Python and parsing RSS feeds and XHTML or, X or XML stuff like that um, so I'm, that's that's a bit slow going but I'm making progress but it's just not ready for prime time yet um, but anyway there are instructions on the on the our podcast site for how you can use the RSS feed within iTunes directly to get the episodes uh, directly posted there until we get quote unquote the formal iTunes version um, so yeah, definitely check the site out. I'm going to try and get back to announcing the new episodes on the on our Twitter handle. We are at the RCast. And, and Dean actually, after the interview, Dean was saying, oh, do you ever look at the Reddit um, subreddit for our stats? And I'm like, yeah, I do. In fact, I even made a subreddit for our podcast, but I haven't done anything with it in a while. So I got to start doing something with that. So that subreddit 
is um, appropriate enough name our podcast. And I do have a link to that in, in the in the our podcast site as well. I definitely need to, at the minimum, just post when I have new episodes there. Um, but also, if you want to provide feedback for the episodes, you have a few different options. Um, each episode now has the ability to comment on the particular episode directly within the site. You're also welcome to use the contact form um, that's directly linked on, on the home site. Or you can always just send me a straight email. The email address is the rcast at gmail.com. So please keep the uh, good feedback coming. A lot of people have been getting back in touch with me saying they, they're really glad I'm doing it again. And I definitely don't want to let you guys down. I want to keep this going as long as, as long as I'm able to. So enough with me uh, blabbering on. That's going to wrap up episode 16. So until next time. End of line.